Invite in Dean Obadala. He's the host of the Dean Obadala Show, weekdays 6 to 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Sirius XM Progress, channel 127, where you are listening to me right now, if you're listening to Sirius XM. Uh, the hashtag or the Twitter handle is SXM Progress. DeanOfRadio.com is his website, and Dean Obadala, O-B-E-I-D-A-L-L-A-H, is uh, Dean's uh, Twitter handle. Uh, Dean, welcome back. Tell me about this new war that the Republican Party has declared on protesters. Well, I think, uh, Tom, first, thanks for having me on. I think it's just a new front of their war on democracy. The first one was the old vote war on the ability to vote, making it harder to vote primarily for black and brown people. Now they've expanded their second front in this war on democracy to include a war on free speech. They've introduced 80, 81 so-called anti-protest bills, as we call them, in 34 states during the 2021 legislative session so far, and some have become law. And the whole goal, really, the, the true essence here, is to stifle free speech of those they don't agree with. Because the whole reason for these laws are the Black Lives Matter protesters last year, even though, as Washington Post quantified, 96, 97 percent were peaceful, no property damage, it, the truth doesn't matter to the right. What matters is pure power. So their latest thing is to prevent Americans from uniting and freely assembling, as we're guaranteed on the Constitution, and expressing ourselves. They are literally making it a crime for peaceful protest by either, such as if you block traffic peacefully, it's a felony. That's what they're proposing in certain places now and in Florida, or raising it from a misdemeanor to a felony. The whole goal is to stifle free speech. And, you know, this just Monday on Florida, Ron DeSantis, Governor, uh, the governor there and the Trump buddy signed into a law, a law that the ACLU says criminalizes peaceful protest and harkens back to Jim Crow. So you get a sense what's really going on here. Yeah, so the, the, the law that Ron DeSantis signed, and this was, you know, at the, at the, at the peak of the Chauvin trial, so nobody was paying attention to yep. what he was doing. Exactly. Um, yep. uh, this, uh, if I, I'm looking at this piece, uh, and I should have mentioned this in my introduction to you, that you wrote a piece titled, We're Not Blind, Anti-Protest Bills Are Actually Anti-BLM Bills, and uh, it's over at the MSNBC website, msnbc.com slash opinion, et cetera, and uh, uh, by Dino Badala. Um, Dean, you, you write that um, this law in, in, uh, in Florida makes it mm -hmm. a second-degree felony publish, punishable by up to 15 years in prison for damaging Confederate monuments or the Confederate flag, uh, creating yep. basically shrines to white supremacy, and also makes it a felony for being part of a protest that becomes violent even if you have nothing to do with the violence. I mean, this is, this, these are huge stretches. It is. And the idea of, look, Seth, there's already a lawsuit against this. The SLU and others are fighting. The idea of being so almost like felony murder. I mean, they're expanding it that way, where in the commission of a felony, you commit a murder. Everyone involved in that is charged with murder. What they want to do is anybody involved in a protest, if someone a mile up from you commits acts of violence, that somehow, arguably, as the ACLU is pointing this out, you can at least arguably be charged with crimes under this new law. So it, the goal is a chilling effect. They don't want people to go to the streets to protest things that the GOP does not approve of. It's that simplistic. It's really, if you're not going to vote for them, they want to make it hard or not impossible to vote. If you're going to say things they don't like, they want to silence you. The GOP is no longer a political party. Party. It's a white nationalist authoritarian movement that has now embrace the essence of fascism with the January 6th violence that the GOP has not denounced uh, in one voice. In fact, they defended Donald Trump in the latest polls. 80 percent of Republican rank and file support Donald Trump. And that's a recent poll two weeks ago. They saw the January 6th attack. You cannot tell me that they're not at least affirming that they're down with violence. We're, we're dealing, yeah. Tom, you, we've discussed it before. We're in a new world here. We have the Democratic Party adhering to Democratic values. We have a GOP that has long been trending toward authoritarianism, now in full embrace of it. And they're counting on the courts to save them in that maybe the part of this law will be upheld. But their goal is, until a court decides, a chilling effect on people going out to protest because they fear being prosecuted. Yeah, there was a study I, I, I talked about on the program a, a week or two ago that was done in collaboration uh, with Harvard and, and a European university. I'm forgetting which one right now. Um, I, I think it might have been one of the Scandinavian countries. 
and they looked at um, over 160 governments around the world and over 1,200 political parties, if my memory serves me correctly, and I think it does. And what they found was that while the Democratic Party in the United States falls squarely within the mainstream of traditional political parties in functioning democracies, you know, the kind of political party you expect to see in Australia or in Canada or in Germany or in France, the, Demo the Republican Party has is so far outside the mainstream that the closest party to it was uh, Viktor Orban's Fidesz party in Hungary, which has basically mm -hmm. taken over the media, has stacked the courts, has has ended democracy, uh, ended all dissent, uh, you know, uh, rigged the elections. I mean, or uh, Erdogan's, uh, I think it's it's called the ISP, or perhaps you know the name mm -hmm. of uh, Erdogan's party in Turkey, that the GOP has become no longer a legitimate political party. They are an outlier no. white nationalist movement, um, basically. Yeah. And uh, I, I guess the and and they're having some success here with these laws. It's kind of ironic that it was just a decade ago that the people who were out on the streets protesting were the Tea Party guys, right? They were the Republicans saying we don't <laughs> you know, we don't want no stinking Obamacare. Um, but uh, but nonetheless. I'm curious your take on this. I mean, you, you have a, uh, uh, in, in some ways, a, a 30,000 foot view, um, being Muslim, being a talk show host, being a comedian, being in the media, you've been around for a while. Mm -hmm. um, I have tremendous respect for your perspective and your, and your, and your, um, uh, your, your overview on these things, your ability to, to synthesize all this information. Do you think that this is the new the new authoritarianism that is going to be the new standard for America? Or do you think that what we're looking at is the last gasp, which this is this tends to be my opinion, but I may be real wrong on this. I, I just wrote a book about this, uh, that this is the last gasp of the old Confederacy, essentially, of a white nationalist movement. There's a lot there, Tom. The one thing I will say for those who say, well, demographic change is coming and that non-white people will be a majority, so hence white supremacy uh, will end or at least be marginalized more. I just want to remind people that, uh, you know, in the 1850s and 1860s, the white people at the time, the nativists, and they hated the Irish and German Italian immigrants who were coming. Well, after a while, yeah. they realized they needed them, and they expanded the definition of whiteness to include them. So what you have is a likely scenario where the what we view as white now will expand to include conservatives who aren't white so that the white nationalists, white supremacists can keep their power. So I don't think it's be as easy as that. There are people who aspire to be white because whiteness has certain benefits to it. At least that's the way it's perceived by people. And they, there is white privilege. We understand that. That's part of it. The second part, this authoritarianism by the GOP, unless they were to consistently lose elections, they're going to embrace this even more. They are desperate. They are fearful of change. They're, they're, they're demographic change specifically, and that they view our society as a zero-sum game, that if a black or brown person achieves something, they believe it's not just good for the black or brown person, it's bad for white people. Now, only six, about 60 percent of white people voted for Donald Trump, so there's over 40 percent voted for Joe Biden, so it's not monolithic, it's not all white people by any stretch, imagination, but there's a chunk there. And, you know, you look at this law, it's like in Minneapolis, they, last week the state senator there, Dave Osmick, if you were convicted of any illegal conduct, you would lose student loans, food stamps, and rent assistance. And that won't become law. There's a Democratic governor, but if they have a Republican governor, that will be a law someplace else. This is their attack yeah. on free speech. It is crazy. And, and Dean, my apologies. We have I, we have to have hard breaks here on the show. So, uh, But thank you so much for dropping by. Dean Obadala, deanofradio.com on SiriusXM. Uh, my friend Dean, thank you.